Hello, my name is Eberhard Kuhn. I am the marketing manager for food and consumer products at Shimatsu Scientific Instruments. And the title of my talk is The Bitter Truth, a closer look at IBU measurements in beer. According to the Reinheitsgebot, which is perhaps the oldest food safety law in the world, there are four basic ingredients that make up beer. Barley, water, yeast, and hops. For the scientific analysis of beer, the American Society of Brewing Chemists, ASBC, actually has 152 official methods for the analysis of beer. That includes the ingredients that go into making the beer, such as the malt and the hops, the beer in the process, what is called the wort, and then, of course, the final product, which is the beer. Most of the methods utilize either a form of chromatography, such as gas chromatography or HPLC, liquid chromatography, or uh, spectroscopy, UV or FTIR. There are 18 methods for hops alone, which includes essential oils in hops, moisture, and what we'll be talking about today mostly is the bitterness, the IPUs. Never succumb to the temptation of bitterness. Now, I'm pretty sure that when Dr. King said those words, he wasn't talking about beer, because in beer, bitterness is actually one of the major flavor components. Uh, the hops, they provide the bitterness, and it's there to balance out the sweetness that you get from the malts. Of course, the hops also have their own aroma and flavor that they add to the beer. There are many varieties of hops and they all have their own unique uh, aroma and flavor. But the hops also provide some other benefits such as antibacterial and uh, preservative qualities. According to ASBC's Beer 23 method, the bitterness from hops is measured by UV spectroscopy, such as the like the one you see in here, the UV 1900i. And then the result, the bitterness, is reported as International Bitterness Units, or IBUs. So while we're on the subject of the Shimatsu UVV beer analyzer, it actually does five types of analyses according to these various ASBC methods that are listed here. So you can measure the color, the tristimulus color, which is a specific color measurement, the bitterness, of course, the polyphenol can content, and the diacetyl content. The ASPC method uh, beer 23 for IBU requires a solvent extraction from the beer that is then followed by a measurement at 275 nanometer with a uh, UV visible uh, spectrophotometer. And then it's calculated there by this very simple formula. You take the absorbance at 275 nanometer and multiply it by 50. So then the IBU scale ranges from 0 to 120. And uh, unless you're a, a trained uh, professional who uh, tastes beer, uh, most people cannot distinguish a bitterness once it gets much above 60. And here you can see, if I said you cannot distinguish much above 60, the majority of beers are actually below 60. Here's the different styles of beers. Uh, you see some of the lighter beers like the Lambic or the wheat beers that have uh, very low IBU readings, often in the single digits. The American Lager, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later, then we'll go into some of the European beers like the Kirsch and the Pilsner. And then ultimately we'll end up with the ones that have the high IBU readings like a Stout or or the uh, India Pale Ale. So let's talk a little bit more about the IBU reading and sort of put it in the historic perspective. You know, the, these ASBC methods were developed several decades ago. And here in the United States at that time in the 60s, 70s, much of the beer that was produced and consumed was a traditional American lager, you know, think Budweiser. And so this IBU method uh, really works well for such beers. However, over time, uh, beer preferences have changed a little bit. And so today, a lot of consumers like the craft beers on it. So this has led to really an explosion 
of craft uh, beers and breweries and they use a lot more hops and they use more hop varieties. So today these craft breweries, they do brew many different styles of beer such as an India Pale Ale, IPA. And with those styles of beers, they don't always fit the convention of IBUs. Let's take a look at the development of the American beer scene over the last 50 years. You see here back in the 1970s, there were just uh, a few breweries, you know, Anheuser-Busch InBev, or today it's called Anheuser-Busch InBev, back then it was Anheuser-Busch Budweiser, you had Miller and Coors, Heineken, and uh, a few imports, and overall, there were only about 100 breweries here in the United States. So now you fast forward to today. So Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Miller Coors, they're still around and they still sell a lot of beers. There's still Heineken and now there are many more imports, not just from Europe, but from you know Mexico, we get imports from Asia. Plus there's just an explosion of these what's called craft breweries. So today, the total number of breweries in the United States is well over 8,000. And there are three basic types of these craft breweries. There are what's called the microbreweries, and there's over 5,000 of them. There are brew pups, and there's over 3,000 of those. And then there are the the regional craft breweries that have started out maybe smaller, but grown more uh, more over time, such as, you know, Sierra Nevada is an example, or even uh, America's oldest brewery, Yingling. And this graph really shows how these number of breweries has just grown exponentially. If you look at, you know, the 1970s, right around 100, and then there was an uptick in the, uh, at the end of the last century. And then just in the last five years, it's just grown tremendously to now over 8,000 breweries today. Okay, now let's go back to our main topic, the bitterness of the beer. The bitterness is caused by the hops and by compounds called alpha acids or humulones. They're extracted from the hop flower during the boiling process in what is called the wort. Then these alpha acids with the heat in the wort are converted to isoalpha acids, which then provide the bitter taste. Because alpha acids themselves are not so water soluble and are also less bitter, while the isoalpha acids are water soluble and very bitter. So on the next slide, we'll see what these uh, structures look like. Okay, now a little bit of chemistry. So let's look at the chemistry of the bitterness. In the center of the slide, you see the alpha acids, and there are multiple acids depending on what the R group is. With the heat in the wort, as the wort is being boiled, these alpha acids are converted to isoalpha acids that you see on the left. But there's also a natural peroxidation happening, and you see the compounds formed on the right that are called humulinones. So I mentioned earlier, uh, most craft breweries brew a wide variety of, of beer styles, and in particular, the IPA, the uh, India Pale Ale, has become the darling of the microbrew industry. And oftentimes, these microbreweries or craft breweries are using additional hops during the later stages of the beer making process in what is called dry hopping. And these dry hopping hops are added after the wort has already cooled down. And here you can see the overall brewing process. There's many, many steps as you can see. If you take, a, and we don't need to be concerned about all the individual steps, but if you take a look towards the center at that little funnel shaped uh, device, which is the, the kettle and the, the, the hops are added there, the initial bittering hops, because that's where the wort is and that is being uh, boiled. And so then as the wort cools down and it's going into these fermentation tanks, that's where often the, the dry hopping happens. And so these additional hops are added now at a cooler temperature. That means they're not converted to isoalpha acids, but they are still providing uh, a, a 
flavor and a little bit of bitterness to the overall beer. So like I said, the dry hopping hops are added at a lower temperature, so they're not producing any isoalpha acids. However, there are still other hop acids extracted. There's the alpha acids, humulones. There are also beta acids, lupulones. And of course, there are the oxidized alpha acids, humulinones. All these acids are actually significantly less bitter than the isoalpha acids. However, they also have a strong UV absorbance around 275 nanometers so that these acids can influence the IBU reading. And here we see actual data. We see the absorbance at 275 nanometers of these different acids. You can see the blue one, which is the isoalpha acid that has the highest absorbance at 275. But the other ones, humulinones, the alpha acids, beta acids, all also have significant absorbance at 275 nanometers. So their presence contributes to the absorbance value that is measured at 275 nanometers. So what that means is then that measuring bitterness by UV alone can give you an inflated IBU number. So if you want to get accurate measurements of the various hop acids, you have to use a different technology such as HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography. And here you see two chromatograms. On the left is the analysis of the alpha and beta acids in the hop pellets, which means it's before the brewing happens. On the right, you see those uh, alpha and isoalpha acids in the finished beer products after the beer has been brewed. So you can see uh, quite a difference. So all the alpha acids have been converted to isoalpha acids, and there's both uh, trans and cis isoalpha acids. Okay, now we've seen a lot of chemistry, but how does that actually relate to actual taste? You know, I realize there's the, the taste of science, but really what we're talking about is the actual taste that we feel when we drink the beer. So as you know, there are different uh, flavors or tastes that we can taste with our tongue, such as the sweet and sour salty but also the, the bitterness. So next we'll look at how is that bitterness perceived. When it comes to taste, the beer analyzer by itself cannot tell you if a beer tastes good. It's the guy on the left here, the brewmaster, that knows if a beer tastes good. And if he gives it a thumbs up, then we know that it's a good beer. And when the brewmaster sets out to make a new beer, a new recipe, he has a certain target in mind. But he doesn't necessarily have to hit the bullseye to get the best beer. He might tweak the recipe a little bit to get the best possible taste in that beer. And it may not be, like I said, the bullseye. But then that's where the machine, the, the instrument, the beer analyzer comes in. Once the brewmaster has defined that sweet spot, then the beer analyzer, the instrumentation, can make sure that you always hit the sweet spot. So it's a matter of quality control. Because it's really the perceived bitterness that versus the IBU that affects the actual flavor and taste of the beer. And if you have beers that have strong flavors, some of the darker beers that use roasted malts, for instance, the bittering effects of the hops are often less noticeable and you, uh, more hops are required to offset the sweetness of the malt because these beers use a lot more malt. So for example, an imperial stout may have an IBU value of 50, but it will actually taste less bitter than say a pale lager that has an IBU value of 30. So it's really man and machine working together. So once the brewmaster, as I said before, has defined that sweet spot, then it's the instrumentation, that beer analyzer, that can help with the quality control. Because if you 
buy a beer today and you really like it and you buy it again next week and the week after that, you want it to taste the same, right? So it's that consistency and reproducibility that ultimately define the quality of the beer. So the beer analyzer and any other instrumentation becomes a very important part of the quality control process of a good beer. In this presentation, we only cover the bitterness and the hop aspect of the beer, but Shimatsu actually has a Shimatsu's total support for beer analysis. That's a booklet that covers all the other aspects of the beer analysis. And you can find it and download it at www.feedyourlab.com. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I hope you found some of the information you saw uh, useful. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to email me at erkuhn at shimatsu.com. I think that's it for today. I think it's time for a nice cold one. So cheers, everyone.